Welcome to the course today. I want to introduce today a technique for camera calibration. That means we want to estimate the intrinsic parameters, so the calibration matrix of our camera, not taking into account where the camera is. So in contrast to DLT, where we were estimating the intrinsics and the extrinsics at the same point in time, we are here trying to estimate only the intrinsics. And furthermore, we want to simplify our life a bit uh, in the sense that we assume to know the 3D locations of control points in the environment that we needed for the DLT. And we will basically use here a checkerboard pattern, so a known printed 2D structure for performing the localization. And this approach, uh, method proposed by Tsang a bit more than 20 years ago, is today one of the standard methods for performing camera calibration and a lot of toolboxes that you use for um, performing your camera calibration actually uses the ideas um, presented here. So um, if we are look at the overall concept, we have that mapping that maps up from the world coordinate to the pixel coordinates and involve this projection matrix P. The projection matrix P um, contains the intrinsic parameters and the extrinsic parameters. That means the calibration parameters, which are the intrinsics, and the um, extrinsic parameters, which is the pose uh, consisting of the position and orientation of a camera. And we are today only interested in the intrinsic, so we don't care where the camera is. We only want to find the intrinsic parameters of our camera. Again, um, the DLT mapping tells me um, how to project a point from the 3D world to um, 2D. And we have the image plane, we have our projection center here of our camera, we have the 3D point in the world that's projected onto the image plane and then goes into the camera. And for fully describing these mappings, we need to have P, which has 11 degrees of freedom. And DLT estimated all these 11 degrees of freedom. So calibration parameters here, the five um, and three translation, three rotational parameters. And today in Sang's method, we don't care about R and X zero and we're only interested in getting the calibration matrix. Okay? So what I assume you to know how that works, uh, how that, to understand the lecture is, I assume you know how DLT works and how we compute the DLT. So if you don't know that, please go back and watch the lecture first on the uh, direct linear transform and how to estimate the direct linear transform because we will basically reuse the solution for the DLT and then need to slightly modify it so that only the last step of the DLT um, is actually different for Tsang's method um, and the first part stays the same. So if you don't know the DLT, please watch um, the DLT lecture first. Thank you. So assuming you know how DLT works, we can now look into Tsang's method, which is a camera calibration approach, but this time it doesn't use known uh, 3D points, uh, three locations of uh, at least six points in the environment. It uses a checkerboard pattern. So what you see here is an image of a checkerboard pattern. This is basically a printout of a black-white pattern, which we assume to know, that you can glue on a flat um, surface um, and then let's say a piece of wood or cardboard or whatever it is should be only should be flat um, and then you can show this checkerboard in front of your camera so you basically dance around with a checkerboard in front of your camera and generate images of this checkerboard pattern and under the assumption that you know the checkerboard um, and you also know that it's a flat surface that's something that we can actually exploit because we're now observing uh, a known structure without actually measuring 3D points in the environment as it was the case for the DLT. So we assume to know this checkerboard. Um, let's say we have observation of this checkerboard from different sizes. This is one example over here. And we assume to know the size and the structure of the checkerboard. And one of the important thing to exploit in here is that the checkerboard is a flat surface. And it is one plane. And this is a key property that we are actually going to exploit. So what we can do is we typically simply run, let's say, a corner detector on that um, checkerboard. So you know how that works, finding interest points or key points so that you actually find the corner points of this checkerboard. So you get a large number of point observations and you at least know where those points are on the checkerboard. So what you do not know is where the 3D location of those checkerboards are in the 3D world, but what you know is where those points are on the checkerboard, right? So this is something that we can assume to know. And then we actually use a trick. And we say for every image, we define an own coordinate system. And the coordinate system is defined in a way that the X, Y plane forms us the checkerboard. So in the, every time the checkerboard deforms, defines the X, Y plane. 
And we can exploit this fact for defining the x, y, z locations of all those points here in this coordinate frame. Of course, it's important to know the coordinate frame changes from frame to frame, but within a frame, we have the same coordinate system. And often this is sufficient, or not often, in this approach, this is sufficient in order to actually estimate the calibration parameters of our camera. So the trick is that all points lie on the checkerboard and lie, which def uh, defines the xy plane of our coordinate system. That means that all the coordinates in the 3D world have a z coordinate of zero. So all those points here have a z coordinate of zero. All those points here have a z coordinate of zero. And all those points here have a z coordinate of zero. Just because for every frame we define an old co own coordinate system where this is actually the case. So this exploits that the checkerboard is a flat, uh, is a plane. So it's glued on a flat surface. And this is kind of a key thing we exploit. And then we know the XY locations as well because we know the size of the printout um, that we use for generating this checkerboard. Okay, so let's see how this assumption that Z equals to zero for all 3D point changes the mass of the overall system and it does it su substantially. So this was the mapping that we used to describe. Um, so this is our homogeneous vector 3D coordinate vector. Um, this is the um, matrix containing the rotational part and the translational part. Um, and here we then have the calibration matrix and this maps it to our 2D pixel coordinate. So now we know that the Z coordinate of all points are zero. So each point has a z-coordinate of zero. So this red circled variable is zero all the time. Okay. So now if we multiply this matrix by this point, knowing that this point is zero, it actually turns out that this column over here has a zero effect on our system because it will be always taken down to zero. So it's something that I don't need to estimate. That means the last column of my rotation matrix is something I don't need here. So this is not needed, so we can actually eliminate those variables from our um, from our um, e equation system because this is the equation system relating our observation with um, our knowledge about our model. So by el eliminating this column and eliminating the third row of this vector over here, we turn into an equation which looks like this. Okay. So a point on the checkerboard the xy coordinate is mapped to the image coordinate and I don't need to know the z coordinate of that um, point in the 3D world or because I know it's zero for that own reference system. So every point on my checkerboard will generate me one of those equations, right? So every point in the 3D world on that checkerboard generates me this equation and the parameters in here and here so these, are, these parameters are the same for all images and all checkerboard observations. And this matrix over here is the same for every frame. So all the points which have been extracted from the same checkerboard um, image. Okay, so that's important to differentiate. We'll need that later on. Okay, so we have a matrix H, which is now a three by three matrix. So these are the multiplication of those two matrices over here. Um, which I can write as three um, column vectors, H1, H2, H3. So this is something that, um, uh, that I can split up into my calibration matrix K and my matrix, which now consists of two vectors R1 and R2, which are the first two columns of my rotation matrix, and then my translation vector T over here. So that one point generates me this equation over here. So I have multiple points. For now, we're just considering one single image. So all the points from the checkerboard that are generated for one single image. So for now, just one single image is taken into account. Um, so we get a number of those equations. If we have i points on our checkerboard, we actually obtain those, this equation over here. And again, these are knowns, these are knowns, and my unknowns actually sit in here. And now it's important to know about DLT. Right. So if you haven't watched the video on DLT, um, I suggest to do that before you continue here because knowing how to solve this requires us to requires you to have seen the DLT lecture. So we can perform this step exactly as the first steps of the DLT. Actually, every step except the last step of the DLT, we can apply in exactly the same way. So if you remember that, we said 
we have our knowns here and our unknowns in here. What do we do? We um, vectorize this matrix H so that it contains um, our nine uh, parameters, H11 to H33. We stack them into a vector and then we compute the corresponding coefficients um, from X, uh, lowercase x and uppercase x, one's the image coordinates and the other one the 3D world coordinates. Um, so that we, instead of having the 3 by 4 projected matrix P as in the DLT, we now have a 3 by 3 um, hom uh, homography, this is our matrix H, so that we then have exactly these um, uh, coefficients for my H, so these are the, this H are kind of the nine stacked values, so it's nine dimensional here, not 12 dimensional as for the DLT, but the rest stays the same. And just to show you the correspondency between the problem that we have here and the DLT problem, I wrote here the coefficient vectors down for the DLT and crossed out all those which go away because they are uh, the z coordinate of all points are zero, so they are eliminated. And I just don't need to build up these um, 12 elements here. I just need to go down to the nine elements that I need because the others I eliminated already from my equation system. Okay. So it's the same as in the DLT, except that we can uh, cross out those three columns uh, or uh, rows from the coefficient vector. And as a result of this, we get a kind of slightly simplified form where it just kind of now uh, crossed out uh, or eliminated all the variables that were crossed out on the previous slide. So then we have my, we have the, the, uh, my unknowns, my coefficient vectors. I get those coefficient vectors and then I need to solve uh, the resulting system of linear equations in order to estimate h. And we can do this using the singular value decomposition as in the same way as we did that for the uh, DLT estimation that we have done. So we may need to think about um, how many points do we actually need in order to estimate this h. Um, so for the DLT, remember, we, need, we required overall um, six different points. Um, but now here the situation is slightly different. So we need to have at least four points to determine H. Why is this the case? Um, because H has eight degrees of freedom. It's a three by three matrix, so it's nine elements. But again, it's a homogeneous matrix, so it only has eight degrees of freedom um, because it's only defined up to a scaling factor. Every point uh, on the checkerboard gives us um, two equations, two observations, an X observation and a Y observation in my, on my sensor. So on pixel location X in X and the pixel location in Y. Um, and so that means we need to have at least four points in the checkerboard in order to do this and in order to provide an estimate for H. And again, this is now image dependent. So it is dependent per image because we define the coordinate system independent for every image based on the location of the checkerboard. And this provides me an estimate for H. And um, after we have computed using the singular value decomposition exactly as we did it for the DLT, we actually come up with an estimate for H. So we have H now. And now the question is, how do I get K from H? And this is the point in time where things change between Tsang's method and the original DLT estimation that um, we discussed. So just as a reminder, what have we done in the, in the DLT? In the DLT, we also had this matrix P that we need to decompose into, um, into matrices. Um, it was actually not fully the matrix P, but the uh, first three by three block out of my matrix that I cut, out, cut it out of my matrix P that I needed to decompose in the rotation matrix and the calibration matrix. Um, and for that, I used the QR decomposition because the QR decomposition was exactly what I wanted to do. It uh, generates for me a rotation matrix and um, uh, upper triangular matrix or lower triangular matrix um, that I can actually generate out of that. And this was exactly what I, was, what I needed in order to obtain my uh, K and my rotation matrix. Now, unfortunately, the story is different because this thing here is not a rotation matrix anymore because we have the translation vector T sitting in here, which basically replace the third uh, column of my rotation matrix. And this is the problem why we can't apply the QR decomposition. So this is now the point in time where the DLT and Sung's method basically deviate and need to generate two different solutions. And it actually gets a little bit more complicated here for Sung's method because we cannot simply apply QR decomposition in such an elegant way as we did this for the DLT. And this is what it makes it more tricky. 
So the question is, how do we now obtain our matrix decomposition? So even if I don't care about this part here, I can ignore this part, but actually get K. So this is, I'm not interested in this part, but I want to get K. And so um, if I have my matrix H, I need to go from H to K. So this is the goal, estimating K from H. Um, so again, the problem, we computed H via SVD, and now we need to extract K. So we need to break up this matrix H into two matrices. One is this calibration matrix, this upper triangular matrix, and this second matrix, where I only know that the first two uh, columns are actually columns from a rotation matrix. Now to do this, there's kind of not a standard decomposition that I can use in order to exploit those properties. So that's something that I now need to do by hand. And by hand means manually exploiting the constraints of things that I know, for example, about R1 and R2. And um, so I need to now to derive an own solution to do this. And this is actually a procedure consisting of four steps. So for the first thing we need to do, we need to um, write down certain constraints that we know. So for example, what do I know about K? What do I know about R1? What do I know about R2? How can I actually exploit this? And I will exploit properties that I knew that R1 and R2 are column vectors from a rotation matrix. And you know the columns of a rotation matrix have certain uh, constraints and I can exploit those constraints, write them down in order to form um, uh, a system of equations that I then need to solve and then be hopefully able to decompose the matrices. So first I will write down the constraints and exploit constraints. Then I will define a matrix B, which is um, K inverse transpose times K inverse. We'll see that this term, K inverse transpose, um, K inverse is uh, a term that pops up in a couple of the equations that I actually write down. And so I define this matrix B um, so that uh, my math gets slightly more similar. And then I will, um, I can find, a, I have to define a system of equations and this system of equations will actually lead me to B. So by solving um, uh, a matrix, uh, by, by solving uh, the system that I derived from the constraints I formulated here in number one, I will be able to estimate the elements of B. And once I have the elements of B, I need to decompose B so that uh, I can break down B and obtain K. So these are kind of uh, multiple steps I'm doing. I'm defining constraints. I'm defining a matrix B, I'm then solving my constraints so they can determine the elements of B, and then I do a matrix decomposition, actually a Cholesky decomposition of B, so that I then obtain my matrix K. So there are a couple of steps in between and a number of uh, coefficients that I actually need to compute in this process, but this then allows me um, to decompose this matrix B. But um, the key thing to start with to understand are those constraints. What are the constraints? Which constraints do I, can I actually exploit from K, R1, and R2? So again, this was, my, um, this was the equation that I have, my calibration matrix here and this remaining matrix R. So what do I know about that? Um, the first thing I know, what I can actually do is, I know that my matrix K is actually an invertible matrix, right? So it was, it's this upper triangular matrix and all the elements on the main diagonal are, um, are unequal to zero. So I know that K is invertible and I can invert my matrix K. This is a property that I'm exploiting now. What I can do is I can invert my matrix K and multiply it from the left-hand side of this equation. So if I multiply it to the left-hand side of this equation, I have K inverse times H and this gives me my matrix R1, R2, T. So um, this is basically what I've written down here. R1, R2, T is K inverse times the uh, three column vectors of H that I have. So H, remember H is known. So this H I do know. What I don't know is K and what I don't know are those parameters here. But what I also know is from this equation that R1 is nothing else than K inverse times this vector because this gives me exactly um, the first element of this equation. The same for the second one. So R2 is K inverse R2 and for T I could do the same but I don't need that for the moment. I only need this for R1 and R2. So I can press, express R1 as K inverse times H1 and K inverse H2. And if I would know K, I could compute R, but if I would know K I wouldn't have a problem in here, I wouldn't need to continue. So the problem is I can't actually compute this right now. right? But I know that those 
this equality exists. So they must be equal to R1 and R2. But what I then can do is I can exploit the fact that R1 and R2 stems from a rotation matrix. So I know certain things about this rotation matrix. Um, so actually R1, R2, R3, although R3 is not relevant here, form an autonomal basis. That means two things. First, R1 transpose times R2 must be zero because those two vectors are orthogonal to each other. So if I compute the dot product, they should be zero. And the second thing that I know is that R1 and R2 are of unit length, so have length one. So these are two constraints that I can actually derive, uh, res uh, extract from this by knowing that R1 and R2 stem from a rotation matrix, so that R1 transpose R2 must be zero, and the norm of R1 and the norm of R2 is equal, and they equal to one. And this is now something that I can exploit. So I use this one over here, this equation, or these two equations actually, and these two equations over here to relate K and H using those constraints down here. So what I do is I just um, take the constraint over here, take R1 from here, and put this K uh, inverse H in, in for A1 and K inverse H2 for R2 and know that this is zero. And this is basically what happened over here. So I, I, this were two equations I had before. I use R1 tran transposed R2 equals zero. So I just put that in. So this is uh, H1 transposed, K inverse transposed, so K minus to the power of minus t means the inverse of k being transposed and this is k inverse h2 must be zero okay so it's something that follows directly from the fact that i know that r was a rotation matrix okay and so that the, the second thing i can do now i exploit the second constraint naming that r1 and r2 are vectors of length one and so i know they must be um, equal and they must have length one so I can actually write down uh, R1 uh, is nothing, or R1, the, the norm of R1 is R1 transposed times R1. Um, is, so it, it turns into H1 transposed K inverse transposed K inverse H1. So not, not two in here. Here was a two that would be zero, but it's one. So this must give me length one. And I know that this must be equal to the same thing done for R2. So this is the second constraint that I have. And what I can now do is I can just move that to the other side. So I again, get an equation where this is equal to zero. So again, here I just move these parts to the other side, it's equal to zero. So this equation, these, equa these two equations are now constraints that I formulated, which relate me elements that I know, which are my, every, my h vectors, they are knowns, with my unknowns, which are here my case, in an equation that equals to zero. And this is something that I will exploit in a second. So the next thing is what I can do now if I kind of write down the equations under each other, I see that this k inverse transpose times k inverse appears in all of my equations. So just kind of um, what I can do is I can just define a symmetric and positive matrix B which has the form k inverse transposed um, k inverse. So it basically can replace this thing by B. It's just a variable replacement for now. Um, and then I have here the form that I have my known vectors over here and my unknown matrix sitting there in the middle. And by knowing that B consists of a matrix transposed times a matrix, I can actually see that there exists a standard matrix decomposition that actually breaks me a matrix up that is symmetric and positive definite into a matrix times the matrix of its transposed. So and this is the Cholesky decomposition. So the Cholesky decomposition of an arbitrary matrix um, breaks it up into two matrices uh, of, of two um, triangular matrices um, and the one is the other one transposed. So if I have B, I can compute the Cholesky decomposition from B and, I would, and it breaks me, gives me the matrix A so that A times A transposed gives me my matrix B. Okay? So this is a decomposition that we typically use for solving our linear systems in an efficient way. But I can also use it here. Um, so if I say A is K inverse transposed and I put it in here, 
then the product will give me B. And if I can turn B into A A transpose, into A, using the Cholesky decomposition, I can directly derive the uh, calibration matrix out of it. The only thing I need to know is I need to compute the inverse and, and invert it. But that's something which is easy with a three by three matrix. So the key insight in here, if we know B, then we can directly compute K. Okay? So exploiting the Cholesky decomposition, we can turn B into K. The problem is we don't have B yet. But so the next step will focus on how to actually get B. And for that, we will exploit these equations over here. So what we have is, um, if we inspect the equations, we have B as a matrix which consists of our unknowns. And given that it is symmetric, a matrix, we only have six unknowns, not nine unknowns. And H are unknowns, and we have two equations that relate B and H with each other and actually sets them equal to zero. And this is something that we actually have seen in the past quite often. So also in the DLT lecture, you have seen that, that we got an equation of a similar form um, that we exploited to compute, to reformulate it so that we have a coefficient vector times an unknown vector equals to zero. And we can actually do this if we have this form of equation over here. And so we'll use basically now the same trick again of using um, this, uh, exploiting the SVD, um, setting up a system of linear equations that we are going to solve um, in, in a very similar way as we used it for the DLT and can use this to compute the matrix B. So again, we have our matri matrix B, which consists of six unknowns. Given there's a symmetric matrix, I only need to care about those six unknowns. So B can be described by, or my small, my vector lowercase b uh, contains the six unknowns of my matrix uh, uppercase b. And again, this is also something which is only defined up to a scale factor. And then I have the constraints from that I have written down before. So the two constraints that you've seen before, I can actually reformulate it with a, with a coefficient, um, which is now a vector v, so that v transpose times b equals to zero. Um, and a second one where if we um, transposed times b minus the different v times b equals zero. So these are basically the coefficients which result from this equation and the coefficients which result from this equation over here. And so again, similar as I did it for the DLT, can set up one constraint which looks like this and a second constraint which looks like this. And now you can see that this thing actually comes much, much closer to um, the thing how we used in the DLT for solving this um, homogeneous system in order to derive our unknowns. And we can do now the same thing. So we can actually set up a matrix capital V, which is defined in this form. So putting the coefficients, uh, stacking the coefficients together. And also you can actually write that down. Vij has of this form, and these are all the elements of my matrix H. So if you actually want to write that down and implement it, you need to know this matrix here. Um, but they can be directly derived from the constraint that we had before. So that for every image, we obtain this matrix here. So this is a matrix, and this is B. So this is a 2 times 6 matrix over here, and this is a six-dimensional vector. Um, this equals to 0. So for every image, I can generate these constraints in here, which, con which uh, must hold for my matrix K, or which for my matrix B, which I then use to compute K, to be precise. So for one image, I can compute my H, and then from this H, compute this coefficient vector exactly using this equation over here. And then the problem is this is just a, um, a two by uh, um, two by six matrix, so I need to stack multiple images together, at least three, so that I would get a six by six matrix. Um, but um, we can take more images, so if I take n images, I get a two n by six matrix, where the first two dimensions relate to image one, dimension three and four to image two, and so on and so forth, so that in the end, image two n minus one and two n um, relate, give me the information from image number n multiplied with my six dimensional vector and this must be equal to zero and this is something that I need to solve. Solving um, a linear system of homogeneous form to obtain my unknown vector B which, would, which then will fill me the elements of my matrix B so that I can then 
using the Cholesky decomposition, turn that into K. So how do I solve such a system? V times B equals zero, which is not the trivial solution. So we impose this additional constraint that B equals to one, and then uh, we need to minimize um, the equation with the norm exactly in the same way as we have done it for the DLT in the DLT lecture using the SVD. So what we are doing, we are um, computing the singular value decomposition and then taking out the um, singular vector that corresponds to the minimum singular value, which should be zero, but is not zero in reality as real measurements are typically noisy. So we take the uh, singular uh, value which has the smallest value, so the, the last one in this diagonal matrix that is generated from the uh, singular value decomposition, take out the corresponding um, singular vector, which then is the solution to B. So then I obtain my B star, which is the singular vector that minimizes this equation, because this is the one which minimizes um, the term over here. Okay, then I have B, and then I just compute my Cholesky decomposition and obtain out my matrix K. So just to sum up again, what's needed in here? We need our checkerboard images, and we need to have at least three of those images. We will extract points out of all those checkerboards and we were exploiting that we know the size of the checkerboard and we know it's a flat surface. And from four points we can compute our matrix H and the matrix H is the in individual matrix H for every image. So we have an own H for this image, an own H for that image and an own H for that image over here. Okay, so H is computed for every image and then each um, of the plane, so each basically each image gives us two equations for computing B, right? So for this B, we got two equations out of every image. Um, since B has uh, five or six degrees of freedom, um, we need three different views of that plane, okay? So um, we have, so this is because B was a symmetric matrix, but it's only uh, known up to a scaling coefficient. So therefore we have in the end five degrees of freedom, but that means we need three different views for three different images in order to compute um, the matrix B. And then I need to solve V times B equals to zero with singular value decomposition and then compute my K out of the Cholesky decomposition. So you've seen here that there were a couple of steps actually needed in order to make this decomposition. So we basically proceeded as for estimating the DLT, but then we had to do some extra work because the matrix we wanted to decompose uh, had not this nice form of being upper triangle matrix and uh, rotation matrix. Um, the properties of the rotation matrix didn't hold. We only knew that for two of the, um, two of the columns that they stem from a rotation matrix. And thus we needed to do this extra work here and then also needed more images because requiring more than one image was something that uh, came from the constraint that we have derived in here. So and therefore we needed three images, not only one image, not only one image because this constraint um, didn't hold uh, that I, um, um, the, that the, the second matrix that I need to decompose is a rotation matrix. This is extra work that needed to be done, but with this extra work, um, we are actually able to do this decomposition in a manual form. And this allows me now to compute my camera calibration matrix, at least the five parameters that are typically in there, in the, or which describe the linear parameters that are involved, um, and which allows me at the kind of the first step of my camera calibration. So you may ask yourself now, what's with the nonlinear parameters? So if you think about the lecture on describing the mapping x equals px, we also talked briefly about um, the, the nonlinear parameters. So what we typically have in this setup is we have an additional, uh, or we have a calibration matrix um, which is multiplied with an, with an additional term here from the left hand side, which is this kind of shift in the x and y, which is dependent, location dependent. So this correction, which takes into account the nonlinear errors we haven't taken into account on it on the past there, um, takes the pixel location in the image plane into account in order to compute basically a shift depending on the pixel location and based on some unknown parameters. And this is multiplied to the calibration matrix K to take into account the nonlinear errors. Things I could do with it is to take into account lens distortion, like um, the barrel distortion over here, um, or kind of the inverse one, or combinations of both. 
and I need to um, have those additional corrections in order to take lens distortion like those or even more complex ones into account. And how we did this, just as a short example, um, this could have been an equation um, which has um, two additional terms over here, or two additional coefficients. One um, is multiplied with the, with the variable r squared and r to the power of 4. This r was the radius or the distance of the pixel from the optical axis to the pixel in the image. Um, and so that basically the further away a point is from the optical axis, the stronger this distortion uh, correction actually gets. And this was one way for performing um, these, uh, these corrections. Um, so kind of this is this barrel distortion is a standard thing that you need to do, especially if you work with wide angle lenses for your corrections and leads to additional nonlinear parameters that uh, get involved into your equation. So these are actually those equations, those parameters which sit in here. And so this shift um, would be described by actually this part of the function. So this is where the pixel was originally, and then this would be the shift parameter that gets involved in here. And you can have additional correction parameters that need to be taken into account. And if you do this and want to perform the camera calibration, you then typically revert to a least squares estimation approach, where you estimate the um, distance between where the pixel of a point is actually projected to into your image and where you expect it to be. So um, you can see this as um, where do I actually get my observation? This is this point over here. So the n is uh, simply the sum of all images because now you take multiple images into account, sum also over the images. And then over each point in an image, where is this point being measured and where should that point be given my parameters and given that I know where that point is. So you have you're basically minimizing the reprojection error. So you're projecting the point back into the image and subtract it from the point where you're seeing it. So you're minimizing the distance, the squared distances between where that point should be and where you actually see that point. And then you perform a least square error minimization um, and, and start taking into account also your nonlinear parameters. Um, and what you typically need for that is you need to have an initial guess. And the initial guess is typically setting the nonlinear parameters to zero and run Sang's method, as I described it here before, as my initial guess. So because, again, it's a direct solution, it's something that doesn't need to iterate and provides me the camera calibration matrix without nonlinear non errors. And then starting from this, we actually run this least square error minimization approach in order to um, find the updated calibration matrix, the nonlinear parameters, and um, estimating the overall process. And this is something that we then um, need to do. So if you do this, just as an example, you get your calibration parameters um, for the checkerboard, if this is your input image, input images, and if you apply the correction parameters, these are your output images. And what you can see here, that this kind of barrel distortion um, that you can see here, for example, that this is not a straight line anymore, leads to perfectly straight lines here in your uh, calibrated uh, uh, after your calibration. So you can correct your images and actually see that those parameters are actually gone, um, the nonlinearities that you want to estimate. So um, that's it basically so far from my side. So what we have done is um, we have provided a camera calibration approach using a checkerboard pattern. And what we were assuming here, that's a pinhole camera. So we assume to have this model x equals px, so that with our standard transformation, we can transform a point from the 3D world with this DLT transformation into my um, image plane. That's kind of uh, the first step. And we are basically calibrating for this pinhole camera model, estimating the, um, these uh, five parameters of my calibration matrix. And then as a second step, we can take into account um, nonlinear parameters um, in order to do further correction than running a least squares approach. And this is a standard approach to camera calibration um, that we're doing here. It allows us to accurately determine uh, the parameters and the checkerboard makes actually calibration rather easy. It's not that you need to have a special calibration room of known 3D points. Um, so you can just take a standard sized paper, do this printout on a printer, glue it on a, on a flat rigid surface like a piece of wood, for example, and then show in front of your camera, make sure every part of the camera actually sees the checkerboard. Um, then you can calibrate your camera and, um, and get your calibration matrix out and then work with the calibrated camera. So um, in calibration in general uh, means that we are estimating our intrinsic parameters consisting of nonlinear and linear errors. The linear one are five errors, and we used Tang's method to esti actually estimate those 
five linear parameters using a checkerboard, and then the nonlinear errors are then estimated um, additionally using these nonlinear least squares approach. With this, I actually come to an end, and this is actually the original work by Tsang, which describes the camera calibration approach, although he uses slightly different notation um, than I used here. And um, if you also want to dive into details, I also recommend uh, first known Robles book on photogrammetric computer vision, which describes all the things about the DLT that we have discussed in detail in here and provides uh, a very rigid, uh, rigorous um, de description on how we can actually estimate those parameters, how uncertainty looks like, actually going into much more details than I have covered it here in the lecture. So with this, thank you very much. I hope you've learned today how to calibrate your camera um, with, the, with using a checkerboard pattern. Um, a lot of standard toolboxes actually use this uh, checkerboard pattern for calibrating your cameras, but I hope for this lecture you have an idea of what's going on internally so that you understand the process better and um, also know why you need to have a certain number of images in order to perform the computations and what are the assumptions that we used and how these decompositions actually look like and that solving linear systems, homogeneous linear systems, is something that pops up very often and is important to know with a lot of relevant real-world applications. So with this, thank you very much for your attention and see you soon. Thank you.